afternoon everyone my name is david and i'm rolling in from beautiful downtown calgary we are thrilled to be presenting today on what we believe to be the most important aspect of programming success relationships before we begin i would like to make a land acknowledgement in from the cold acknowledges treaty 7 territory the ancestral and traditional territory of the blackfoot confederacy ghana pikani and Siksiga, as well as the Sutina Nation and the Stony Nakoda First Nation. We acknowledge the many First Nations, Métis and Inuit, whose footsteps have marked these lands for generations. We are grateful for the traditional knowledge keepers and elders who are still with us. We recognize the land as an act of reconciliation and gratitude to those whose territory we stand on. Chers amis francophones, C'est un plaisir pour nous d'être ici et de vous faire cette présentation. Nous répondons à vos questions avec plaisir en français pendant le Q&A, mais aussi pendant le chat. N'hésitez pas à nous contacter par la suite pour discuter un peu plus avec nous. Because relationships are really important in our work, I will tell you a little bit about ourselves. First of all, Nathaniel is a proud father of a daughter, 12-year-old Annika. Nathaniel is originally from Montreal, has been in Calgary since 1998. Like myself, he's an avid sports fan. He loves food and traveling. He has been to an astonishing 98 countries. He has continued to travel through cooking since the pandemic has started. Nathaniel and I often talk about kimchi recipes, Korean food, and yes, we have talked a little bit about Squid Game. Merci, David. And yes, David and I do often talk about Korean food. Um, it's a huge privilege because because David lived in Korea for a year and is married to a Korean woman, so he's got some great insights. Uh, David's also a father to a beautiful little girl, Everly, who turns two this month. And November is going to be special for him, not just because of his daughter's birthday, but also because the World Cup qualifiers are coming to Edmonton later this month. David is a huge soccer fan. And in fact, he's a big sport fan all, all through and through. He appreciates the way sport can break down barriers between people. But enough about us. Let's talk a little bit about In From The Cold. So what is In From The Cold? Well, we are a low barrier family emergency shelter operating in Calgary. Our vision is of a community where no family or child is homeless. And the way we work towards that vision is through offering services across the full, full continuum of, of care. What that means is prevention and diversion, trying to help families in the community before they have to, before they get into crisis and, and require emergency shelter. Through our emergency shelter, which offers 20 family units uh, for families that are in crisis and need that 24 seven support. And finally, through supportive housing, that's helping families that are living in the community through with case management and with subsidies. The full continuum of care and, and a bit more details around it is available in the attachment that we included with our presentation. Trauma-informed and Housing First Principles guide our work, and more importantly, as individuals and as an agency, we recognize the harmful legacies of Canada's colonial past, and we are committed to learning from and listening to the Indigenous community as we strive to be better allies in building a brighter future. When we're talking about family homelessness, we're talking about a, a, an issue that has varied causes and is quite complex. Individual family issues can lead to housing instability. And within one family, there could be multiple different uh, issues that emerge. But as we well know, the biggest issue, the biggest barrier to housing stability is in fact a systemic one, poverty. Couple that with rampant racism and discrimination, which leads to certain groups being dispropor disproportionately represented in the, in the homeless, uh, homeless sector. And we see that there are some problems that an individual agency can't solve alone. For us, the two biggest challenges that, that we deal with when we're designing, pro, designing and delivering programs are number one, that families are unique. Each family is a unique situation and what care they need, what services they need, what services will deliver the greatest impact can vary from, from family to family, but also from week to week making it very challenging to identify robust programming that can meet the needs of all the different families and all the unique situations that, that we see come through our door. The other 
significant issue that I'm sure many of you deal with on a day-to-day -day basis is the lack of resources. There are a finite amount of resources. Funding is hard to come by. And so with those limited resources, we have a big responsibility to effectively steward those resources and ensure that they're delivering the biggest possible impact and that we're meeting the most amount of need that we can. In trying to solve those two challenges, uh, economist Dan O'Flaherty coined a term that really describes uh, the, the issue. He called it a Goldilocks problem. Goldilocks in the sense that you don't want to have too hot or too cold. You need to find the just right solutions and connect them to, to the right clients. And so in our work, what that means is that we want to avoid providing resources or supports to a family that even without those interventions would stay housed. And on the other side of the, on the other side of the coin, we don't want to be supporting families with prevention and diversion interventions if those interventions won't actually prevent them from being, from ending up homeless. Now, the advancements in data analytics and capturing data, which, you know, is present in every sector, is a good thing. And at the same time, it does create further challenges for organizations like ours, as funders and donors look to have reliable, robust data to justify the programming that you deliver. And yet the programming that we deliver, like I mentioned earlier, sometimes has to be varied. And so how do you collect robust information around situations that might be quite unique? It is a difficult problem, no doubt about it. The other piece of it is that the outcomes that we're looking at, while they can be measured with KPIs and they can be framed in charts and spreadsheets, we're not talking about widgets. We're talking about human lives and human experiences. And sometimes a subtle, a small, subtle change or a small, subtle moment of compassion is all that a person needs to find the stability, to find the dignity that they've been seeking to start their path into independence. How do you quantify that? It's, it's a difficult challenge. When we look at that challenge, we ask ourselves a few questions. How do we be even more responsible in stewarding the limited resources available to us? How do we ensure that we're continuously providing the most compassionate care that we can? How do we ensure that human dignity, dignity and equity are factored in when we're evaluating our programs? These difficult questions for us always bring us back to one clear answer, relationships. Relationships are at the heart of everything we do, including how we measure and evaluate our programs. Relationships build bridges to our clients, allowing us to better meet their needs. And so on that point, I'm going to pass it over to David, who will talk to you a little bit about some concrete ways that that shows up in our work. So thank you very much, Nathaniel. I've, you've, you've pointed out building relationships is about building bridges. Bridges internally with our staff, which allows us to then build better bridges to our clients. We build relationships based on trust. So what does that mean in practice? So myself as a frontline staff a few years ago, I remember that when I was doing an assessment, it took me an entire hour and I was basically chasing information. I wasn't really able to try to build a relationship. So from that experience, we understand that it is critical to work with our frontline staff to inform their day-to-day -day interactions. We also need to balance the need for data with the need for a process based on dignity, relationships, and the OCAP principles of ownership, control, access, and possession. It is especially important for us as many of our clients are indigenous and we want to respect how we share their stories if we are allowed to do it. Overall, we focus on relationships to get better data, to tailor our services, but most importantly, we want to tailor the interactions. I have worked closely with our shelter team to involve staff in decision-making, to hear their voices. In the last few years, like many of you likely, we have revisited how we collect data. We have streamlined our database, simplified the processes so that staff can engage in meaningful relationships rather than spending time on data entry. We have also made our intake more inclusive. One example of a project we have worked on where sometimes you think maybe we should keep things a bit you know, simple is a survey to assess the short-term needs of our clients in our shelter. 
And first I wanted to use technology, but I was brought back down to earth by our shelter team who told me, David, you know what? I think for our clients, they're tired of doing online surveys and filling out forms. So why don't we do a paper version of it that will allow them to engage with our staff? Also, when you use handwriting, you really get involved with the information compared to, you know, let's say doing it digitally. As a result, we have also gotten a higher response rate of approximately 60%, which is higher than what we could have done digitally. We have gotten positive feedback from these surveys, but most importantly, we have gotten constructive feedback. And why is that? We have built a place of trust for our clients to share their feedback candidly with us. So we can actually move forward and we don't ignore the issues at hand. We also need to be cautious when we share the findings of these surveys with our teams internally. For instance, our kitchen team was disappointed to hear that satisfaction with food services was at 80%. They aimed for 100%. Even though when you think about it, a restaurant review of 80% would be really good. And our leadership team felt they were doing a great job. So what we did is we called a meeting with them and we clarified that the information was based on a small data set. And that over time, satisfaction was actually higher in the 90s. So what we need to do with survey results is explain the different nuances in those results and remind the staff not to lose sight of relationships, which are hard to quantify. As we know, it is very difficult to measure the success of our programs long term, the impact of the work we are doing. So we have built a survey to assess the long term effects of our shelter services. We built it on methodologies that are proven best practices and partnerships. This survey we conducted by phone, our frontline staff gets in touch with the clients. They already have trust, which helps the clients open up. Some of the questions we ask in the survey are about their current housing situation, whether they are connected to the community, and most importantly, what is the impact of the services we have provided to them on their housing independence. To help staff to prepare for this survey, we provide comprehensive training, including motivational interviewing to help them make the survey conversational. Also, we have done mock interviews and continuously refine the survey based on staff inputs. By staff being engaged in this process, they really start to understand the impact of their work long term. Also, they understand where is the client at after they leave our services. Early results have shown that, as we wouldn't be surprised, system navigation to access resources and to maintain housing is a big challenge for our clients. So they need trust. They need trust in the larger system. Through this study so far, clients have shown an appreciation for hearing from someone that cares, truly cares about their success and that of their family. As our theory of change underpins, positive relationships help with the trust that is needed for that sustainability. Over time, we hope that this study can make a larger impact in the sector. We will be in touch with our clients for two years and possibly longer. We have been already in touch with them for six months. So far, our response rate has been approximately 20%, which we think is a great start. But we need to make sure this project is sustainable. We need to create some data collection methods around it. So we have built a follow-up module in our centralized database to keep track of this important data for many years to come. Traditionally, academics and system planners do this kind of study. But what we're doing here is we're bringing data collection to the front line, to the clients who actually are living the experience. So we believe we can be transformative with this study and make a larger impact on the sector. Thank you, David. Engaging staff in the process every step of the way, listening to your clients, to your staff, and KISS, keep it simple, silly. Three pretty straightforward principles that will get you on the way to infusing relationships into your data collection process and allow you to better evaluate and innovate in your programming. That's what we've learned in the last year, thanks to the work, the tremendous work that our data team has done 
engaging our staff and getting that buy-in from every level of our program staff in the process of better data collection. On top of that, I think it's fair to say, you know, when we were confronted with the realities of COVID, there was another piece that was instrumental to our staff's success in implementing better data collection. And that was embracing an open mindset of being okay with failing, okay with making mistakes. COVID exacerbated that because, well, when the global pandemic hit, none of us had any idea of how best to keep families safe. There were no cookie cutter solutions. There were no quick fixes. We had to be constantly, constantly scouring every possible resource to learn as much as we could. And at the same time, try, try, and accept that some of the things that we were going to try weren't going to work because that happened often. Now, my background, I came from high performance sport and the corporate world. The idea of failing and failing fast, the, the idea of embracing mistakes is well understood. It's common practice of all the best performers and all the best organizations. And so borrowing from that and borrowing from those best practices, we tried to infuse that mindset into our, our program team. The big challenge with that, of course, is that when you're talking about widgets or winning trophies, well, failure is not the end of the world. When you're talking about families, children's lives, well, those mistakes can be quite costly. Already as it is, as you well know, we deal with things in our sector, deaths, child removals, addictions, the kinds of traumatic events that our clients go through and then vicariously that our staff live, live with as well. And so asking staff to be okay with and, and show some courage in making mistakes is not a small feat. With humility and, like I said, a lot of courage, our staff stepped up to the challenge and that's allowed us to innovate and try different things, shifting our programming to the virtual environment, um, moving our operations. We've actually had to shift our shelter operations three times in the last 18 months. And all of that, again, because of the ability to embrace a, an open mindset. Sorry. Um, the last piece that I wanted to share with you today um, was speaking to that simplicity the slide that I advanced to a little bit too quickly there. In that slide, what you see is a child satisfaction survey. This is one of the first surveys that we rolled out. And as David alluded to earlier, a paper survey. We we're looking to try to capture the voice and the experience of children, because it's not just the adults that need to inform our practice. It, it is the experience of the children. We spend a lot of time and energy trying to create programming to make their experience here a little bit better and to set them up as best we can for success when their family transitions out of the shelter. But we need to understand better what, what the children felt about our programming. Well, if you take a moment to look at this, anyone who has children or who's worked with children will understand very quickly what this child was trying to communicate. Yeah, they loved the toys. They loved the books. They enjoyed the activities. But overwhelmingly, this child valued and appreciated the people. That was important for us to understand because as we're tailing programming, programming and we're finding ways for our staff to have the time and the bandwidth to properly engage with children, this validated those efforts. But also, really importantly, sharing this feedback with our staff, bringing it back to the frontline staff so they could see the impact that they're having, so they could better understand it. It, it did bring a few staff members to tears. So that's why, again, when you talk about the data collection and analytics, yes, it's important. And yes, we can use all sorts of interesting software and devices. But at the same time, we want to make sure we keep it simple enough so that we're able to listen to all of the different voices um, of the people that we serve. The last piece I wanted to share uh, in, re in relation to this is, a, is going back to that idea of the unique experience, the unique lived experience of our clients. In expanding your surveying and data collection, you're going to get a lot of responses. As David mentioned, some of them will be positive, but some of them will be critical. And as we try to tailor our programming to meet the need, it is always a challenge of how do you meet the needs of someone who's not satisfied, who's not happy, if that doesn't fit into your scope of programming? And the answer is you can't. You can't solve every single need. You can't meet everyone's expectations all the time. That's a given. When we're collecting that lived experience, it's also important to remember that different people who experience the same thing might have a very different perspective on what they value the most. 
for myself as a child, I spent some time in an emergency shelter, a domestic violence shelter. It was a really tumultuous week, as you might imagine, a very difficult moment in time for my mother and my brother and I. And while that week was traumatizing as a whole, the experience that I had at the shelter wasn't. And why? Well, because a young man who invested time and energy in me and taking me to the park, going to swim, going to meet other kids in the neighborhood, he helped not only normalize the, 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 the stay, but he also helped me feel connected. He invested in a relationship. And even though it was only for a few days, over 30 years ago, I can't tell you the amount of times that it's come back front and center in my mind as a, as a fond memory. That could have been a very different experience for me had he not been able to invest that time in that relationship. And so when we look at our work, yes, we want to quantify. Yes, we want to collect as much data as we can. But we have to remember that the impact of the work we do, the impact of those relationships will continue to give for years and years and years in ways that we'll never be able to fully capture. In conclusion, I do want to emphasize, if you're going to center relationships in your data collection, it's about engaging the staff in the process early and often. It's about focusing on simple, client-friendly solutions and about embracing mistakes as a key to learning. If you do that, you'll do a better job of listening and the better job of listening that you do will help build stronger relationships. Thank you very much for your time this afternoon. We hope that some of our insights might inspire you to try something different or to innovate a little bit more. And we welcome any feedback, questions, and ideas of how we can do a better job. Sincerely, Nathaniel and David. Thank you.